SSRI SIP interactions. And I know what you're thinking. You f hate SIP interactions. And that's because you've been conditioned to think it's this painful, overly complicated, overly burdensome thing. But I'm here to teach you that it's not. You can do this. It's easy. Drug-drug interactions are a super important thing. I think an unfortunate consequence of prescribing through an EMR is that providers become completely numb to warnings. I'm sure if you've ever used an EMR, you've clicked through a million of these and you no longer read them because you've been trained to not read them. So first let me talk about why I think people think that SIP interactions are so complicated. And that's because they're presented in charts like this. I mean, look at this thing. What the f is one plus sign? What is two plus signs? What is three plus signs? It's, it's, it's nonsense. And then to top that all off, there are question marks in the chart. And how the f does a plus minus sign not deserve a question mark if you're using question marks? But even if you're some freak of nature who's willing to shove these plus signs and question marks and random numbers and letters into your head, to make matters even worse, I've never seen two charts that have the same number of plus signs or agree on what the interactions are. There are reasons that these differences exist amongst the charts, but I don't want to turn this video into an even angrier rant against Big Pharma. So I want you to learn the important parts of the SIP interactions without having to look at a migraine-inducing chart. I'll make a nice video that makes it much simpler, but for a very, very fast review. SIP enzymes metabolize drugs, which typically they just take the drug and they modify it. Don't let yourself get overwhelmed when you hear words like oxidative or reductive or hydrolytic modifications. It's just saying that the drug is being modified. The vast majority of drugs are modified in a way that makes the drug inactive and allows the body to excrete it. But it's important to keep in mind that some of the modifications create metabolites that are also active. And in the case of what's called a prodrug, the SIP enzyme will take an inactive drug and modify it in a way that is active. But the important part to take away is that the drugs that go through the SIP enzymes are called substrates. So let's list out the SSRIs. There's paroxetine, fluoxetine, fluvoxamine, there's sertraline, and then there's citalopram and escitalopram. So with four pretty easy to remember facts, by the end of this video, you're gonna know all the key SIP interactions of the SSRIs. So I think you can see here that I kind of split these SSRIs into three different groups. There are the ox drugs, so that's paroxetine, fluoxetine, and fluvoxamine. And then there are the prams, that's the citalopram and escitalopram. And sertraline's kind of in the middle. So the first fact is that all the SSRIs inhibit 2D6. That means the oxes, the prams, and the leans. The second fact is that the oxes are potent inhibitors and cause major drug interactions. I find this easy to remember because there's an X in the oxes. It's like a big warning X. So this big X in the oxes reminds me that these are not drugs you can mess around with with drug-drug interactions. They will cause potentially clinically dangerous interactions. Fact number three, the flus are bad all over. So the flus are fluoxetine and fluvoxamine. So with fact number two, you already know that it causes major drug interactions. Now with fact number three, we know it's not just 2D6. So the flus also hit CYP3A4. And maybe it's silly, but flu is three letters, and these drugs also hit 3A4. And then fluvoxamine also does 1A2 and 2C919. But listen, don't get overwhelmed. The key thing to remember is the oxys causes major drug drug interactions, and the flus hit a few of the CYPs. Now, fact number four. The SSRIs with the least interactions are the PRAMs and sertraline at less than 150 milligrams. So sertraline might be the safest bet at less than 150 milligrams. And this might be stupid, but it's proxetine, fluoxetine, fluvoxamine. And then sertraline is like one of the oxes, but lighter. So it's not really bad like the oxes, but it, it's almost like a cousin that it, it needs to be above 150 milligrams for it to be significant. So I don't think that was that bad. And let's go back to the chart and we can see that we now basically have the chart memorized. Right, so fact number one, they all inhibit 2D6, so my brain puts one check mark down the 2D6 column. Then we know the oxes are problematic because you picture that big red X in the middle of the name. So boom, we see the three check marks on fluoxetine and three check marks on paroxetine. Then fact number three, you know the flus are kind of bad all over, and then it's flu, which is three letters, so 3A4. And then fact number four reminds us of the drugs that are on the safer end. So I'm going to quickly go one small step further to think about how to think about the drugs it interacts with. And this won't be exhaustive, but I think it's just going to show you a way to approach it so that it's manageable. So here's a ridiculous and overwhelming list of the drugs that are substrates of 2D6. So now the truth is whenever you add a drug, you should be looking at a drug-drug interaction checker. But I review this because I think it's helpful to have an instinct for which drugs are not appropriate to mix. So looking at this list, your brain's not processing it. So you need to take it and make it simpler. So the drug classes that I see, I see antipsychotics, I see TCAs, I see antiarrhythmics, I see beta blockers, I see opioids, I see tamoxifen, but even that's going to confuse my little brain. 
to take it one step further. I see hard drugs, I see psych drugs, and I see painkillers. So we obviously didn't learn everything here, but I think we started the process of extinguishing the conditioning you have for the pain of drug-drug interactions. Thanks. Thanks.